Hey everybody, I hope you can hear me well and you can see me well. Let, let's check. Uh, this is the webinar uh, number 45 about object oriented programming. I'm going to ask in the chat whether they can see me right now. It's live, so we're going to you know, record right now and it's going to stay on YouTube for forever. Um, I do these webinars every month, as you know, they're all about object-oriented programming. I've done 44 before, this is 45, we're going to talk about uh, immutability in object-oriented programming and how it works and how it doesn't work. I'll, I'll show you some a few practical examples, actually four practical examples, and, uh, and then we will compare them and then I hope that will help you understand immutability better and object-oriented programming better. So can you hear me? Can you see me? Can you say that? Uh, yeah, okay. It sound has some noise, so let me check the noise. I think it's it should be okay now. Uh, the microphone is here. Okay, anyway, there shouldn't be any noise, I guess. Anyway, you can hear me. Uh, yeah. Guys, so let me check the the, the, the sounds. Oh, there should be shouldn't be any noise. But can you really not hear me, or I don't think I can do anything. I believe. Okay, now it's okay. All right. Uh, so uh, object-oriented programming and uh, immutability. So I'm gonna I actually I'm gonna base my uh, this webinar on the blog post which I wrote, uh, let me check, uh, in 2016, so it was three years ago. And uh, there I said that there are four types of immutability in object-oriented programming. And most programmers think that uh, there is only one type of immutability, that something that is, is immutable, which means constant, which I'll show you right now, but it's not true. So I'll show you four different types of immutability of an object and we'll compare them. I'm going to use uh, Ruby as an example um, and uh, it's it's quite simple language uh, which you know any programmer should understand. It's object-oriented so it has classes, it has methods and it should be easy to understand. The webinar is going to take about 45 maybe 50 minutes. So let's be um, as quick as possible and let me show you four different classes. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to demonstrate to you how in four different cases we have immutable objects, but they are immutable in a different, on a different level. And um, just a few words about the, the theory, you know, um, what, what immutability means. Uh, when we have an object, we have to encapsulate something inside. An object may not exist without dependencies, without attributes, which we encapsulate when we uh, create an object. Let's take a look at this object, for example. This is a, a class, that's, that's the entire code. It has the constructor and it encapsulates time. Time is an argument of the constructor and then we assign this time to the attribute. When it starts with this sign, it means that this is the attribute. And, um, and then the question is, what do we do after? The object is created, the attribute is there, we, we encapsulated it, we have it right now inside an object so we can touch that attribute inside. And, and the question is whether we're going to mo modify it later, whether we're going to change it later. Many people, many programmers, many software, many, in many examples you will see uh, people saying that an object is something which encapsulates some data and then on the, during the life cycle of the object, that data are supposed to be modified. So the object is like a container of data. You create an object, you inject the data inside, and then those data are supposed to stay there or be modified, and you may do something like, um, here's the unit test for, uh, for this class. I'm using actually the real life application. It's a real life GitHub repository uh, which again I'm gonna see I'm gonna give you the link in the in the, um, in the show notes below the video and um, and you will be able to see all of that code yourself but here is uh, how uh, most people think we can uh, use an object so we create an object here's here's our class we make the 
the constructor, and then we encapsulate this, and then we can say time equals to something else. That's a current time. And then we can say time equals to That's what that's what you're trained to do when you read any book about object-oriented programming. Well, aside from from Elegant Objects book, which which I wrote, so you are supposed to be able to do something like that. So you can set the time. So here's the same object, the same object called a go, and you can inject again and again something in there, and while the object is still alive. So it's it's exactly here. It's exactly the same object. Uh, but it is being modified, their attributes, its attributes are modified during the life cycle of an object. That's what traditional object-oriented programming, well, traditional languages believe we should do, we should deal, that's how we should deal with objects. And then I think is, it is mutable. Well, I think it's wrong, but this is mutable uh, attitude. So they, this object is mutable because we can mutate, because we can change what's inside. So the object mutates. Uh, I believe this is a bad idea. I believe that objects are supposed to be immutable only. But I'm not dogmatic about their 100% uh, uh, immutability, which would mean a constant state. And let me show you now four different immutability levels. The first one is this one, actually. The first one is this one. This is an object which is completely immutable and is a constant. I give it the name constant. Um, uh, let, me, let me show you how it works. This is the unit test. So we have a text, how are you? And then this is the name of the class. We create a new object, we encapsulate this text and then we call the method to underscore s, which converts the text how are you to the hexadecimal representation. So if you, uh, we can say, we can print it here and see what it is. Yeah, here's the text. So I can even say, I can make an assertion here and say that hex equals to this line. And the test will go, will pass. So this result, the result of this method to ask, and this is the only method, take a look at it. That's the only method in this class. This is the class, and this is the only method. The, the, the result of this method, this is how it works, does not depend on anything aside from this text, as in any object, actually, mutable, immutable. Well, as in, as in, I think, yeah, in any object, any object takes something which is encapsulated, or it can go somewhere, of course, to some, of course, to some global variables somewhere. But in this case, it's it's perfectly immutable piece of code, piece of you know object, and um, and it doesn't depend on anything except this text. So when I encapsulate, how are you? I will always get this text back. Today, tomorrow, in a few years, no matter what's happening outside of this object. This is a constant. It's always, it always behaves the same way. We can, uh, we can write another text. Well, we can write another test. Uh, let's say, let's break it down into two tests, actually. The first one prints. The second one, this one prints. And this one parses back because we have two classes. The first one, uh, you know, gets it to you know, gets it into one direction, into one direction, this way. And here we can do uh, a different direction, two text. Then here we encapsulate uh, the hexadecimal representation, and we're supposed to get back the text. You see, they're both directions. They're all of both of these classes. They are constant when you run. The test should pass. Yeah, that's the the first, the most primitive level of immutability, and it's obvious to everybody. And most people refer to immutability when they see something like that. 
they say that uh, an object is immutable when it behaves this way. That no matter when you call a method, any method of the object, it's going to be the same result over and over again. It is true for a constant, but it's not true for other immutability levels. And the second level is, I call it in the blog post which I wrote, uh, too much noise on the background, excuse me, I will try to fix it now. Is it better now? Uh, because I think the microphone is too sensitive, maybe. Uh, can, you, can you tell me what you, what you hear now? I hope it's better. Maybe the sensitivity is too high of the microphone. I'm sorry about that. I can just, you know, get rid of the microphone this way. What about now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I think you should hear me now better. Anyway, now I'm using the, the built-in microphone. So uh, the second level is, I call it in the blog post, I say, not a constant. The first one was a constant, the second one is not a constant, but it's still quite uh, immutable. And let me show you what I have in mind. Uh, let me show you what I have in mind. Okay, they know the sound is better now. Uh, here's the next level. Let's take a look at this class. It encapsulates the time, some time on the you know time scale, some time, and then it converts it to a text which says one day ago or a second ago or a month ago or a year ago, something like that. So let's check, take a look at the, at the unit test. So first of all, we say a go, that's the name of the class, and then we encapsulate time. And, uh, and then if I uh, say uh, a go, if I convert it to S, then it's going to say just now, because it, it, the, 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 moment of, the moment in time was just a few micro, you know, milliseconds ago. And it can convert, like if I take a current time, in seconds, in Ruby this is in seconds, it's a, it's a floating point number actually, in seconds. And then I uh, deduct one hour, then it's going to say one hour ago. If I deduct uh, uh, five hours or six hours, then it's going to say me, it's going to tell me six hours ago. If I give uh, one week, then it's going to give me, you know, one week ago. And it does work, so it, it, it prints the text, it converts the time to text, but keep in mind that when I make an object like this, and then if I say here, and I sleep for five seconds, for example, then the test is not going to pass. It sleeps for five seconds, and now the text is not going to be just now, it's going to be something else. Look, it says five seconds ago, instead of just now. But the, the object is the same. It still encapsulates the same uh, stuff inside, the same object inside, the same value. The time is still the same, the time it points to. For nothing changes inside the object, the object is still the same, but the situation around the object has changed. The time has lapsed already, so there are five seconds later, and that's why the result of this method is different. Is it an immutable object? I believe it is, because the object encapsulates something and nobody can change that encapsulated attribute. But the result of this method depends on, for example, this one. So it calculates the difference between the encapsulated time and current time. And because it depends on this, actually this is the pointer to the global variable, to the global timer, to the global uh, clock, which is ticking. And uh, every time I call to S, then, uh, then uh, we make a call to the global uh, variable or something. And then we compare that global stuff, which is constantly changing every nanosecond. And then we calculate the difference. And then we turn it into a text. So is it an immutable object? It is. It is immutable, but it works with something which is mutable. It works with something which is located somewhere on a global, uh, you know, territory somewhere. 
and is uh, and is mutable. And that's why every time I call to S, I actually may expect different things. And actually, this unit test, if you look at it, like you know, if you if you be really um, precise about the uh, the quality of unit testing, then you would say that this is not a good unit test because the good this unit test assumes that uh, the execution of these two lines will be fast enough that the method to s will say just now. But if I run this test on a very slow computer, which will execute this one and then sleep for a second for some reason, maybe the the server is busy. Or for some reason, you know, you may run it on a very slow computer, then the test isn't going to break. Even one second is going to break the test. Let's take a look. See? It says one second ago, and here it says just now. Let's sleep for a, a fraction of a second and see what, what, what's happening. No, now it worked. Because the precision of this method inside, of course, of this between, of this library, which is not mine, the library which calculates the difference is not precise enough. So it just takes, uh, you know, just um, understands. It doesn't pay attention to milliseconds or microseconds. But if that library would be more precise for, you know, for the business reason, because we don't need more precise, but in general it may happen. That it, may, it may be more precise. Then the unit test would not be a good unit test. Something else would need to happen. For example, I don't know. I would need to. I would need to mock this stuff somehow. Maybe mock this uh, global dependency to make sure that uh, actually the difference of these times are uh, exactly the, the zero when we run the test. Because here I assume that the difference is zero. But my point is that this class is immutable. I believe so because it is not. It does not allow anyone to change its attribute. It doesn't allow anyone to modify the attributes. Whatever is encapsulated stays with the object forever. So you cannot say a go dot time. You cannot. You cannot do that. I don't know zero. It's not possible. It is immutable class. So that's the second level of immutability. It's not constant because the method returns different things all the time. But it is immutable. It's a good design. I believe so. Uh, Let's go to the next level, the third level, which in the blog post, um, which in the blog post I called a represented mutability. Uh, the represented mutability is this one. The class is called the owner. Let's take a look what's happening in this class. Um, actually, it is close to the previous one, but more more obvious that it represents something that is mutable. Look, uh, it. It is a you know object which encapsulates two things: uh, login and uh, pgsql. In Ruby, you can use this uh, semicolons in order to to make it possible to uh, provide the attributes by their names, not just uh, consequentially like you do in C plus plus in Java, but you can call them like this. You can say owner new and then say logging equals to this pgs field so you can change the, the the order of them you can you can you know provide them in different order and it's going to work it's quite convenient uh, i think so you encapsulate two things you encapsulate encapsulate what's the logging of the owner of the account and what is the uh, the postgres library which has the data and then the method called months Months means tell us the monthly statistic statistics of this account owner. So make an account owner. Here's the unit test. Uh, first, we create the random owner, the random account name, and then we say, okay, there is the class which points to the owner and to the test PGSQL. So this is the the pool, the connection pool to the test server, not the real one. And then, for the sake of testing, we create a new list. This library, this this application we're talking about, is called Mailanes, and it's a, it's a it's an online manager of mailing lists. So we create a mailing list. We create we make lists, and then we add a new list. So we get a list that's an object, and then we create a collection of recipients. So who are in this list, and uh, and then we three times we add three different recipients. 
we say like you know users who are in the list and we do it three times and then we say okay owner give me the statistics your monthly statistics um, here we can say source let's make it good source 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 yeah and we need the source is something like random I don't know that's a source some temporary source and then we say okay owner give me the data of what's in your uh, what's the you know monthly statistics and then we assert that data um, the, the first line of the data it's it's a collection it's an array of uh, associated arrays array of let's put them let's say not yeah array of um, of arrays and then we check what's the total and the total has to be three just we added three three lines so it's gonna be three so what's happening in these methods we the object owner points to two things encapsulates two things the login and the database and then it says hey the database execute the long SQL query it doesn't matter what's here but it calculates the statistics and then it's it, it does the processing of the statistics and return the result returns the result is it immutable that's my question this class is it immutable or not it may seem like something quite mutable because as you can see you look at the, like in the unit test we created the object here and if I call it here, look, I say, hey, owner, hey, owner, uh, let's do the source here. Hey, owner, give me your monthly statistics. We need to provide the source here. And it's going to be, uh, count is gonna be uh, yeah let's say count so how many lines do you have there and it's gonna be zero because there's nothing we just created it so let's run it to make sure it works yeah it works so let's see what happens first of all we do exactly here look I just created the order and here runs the SQL query boom 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 zero milliseconds it returns zero it returns nothing so there is nothing in the database for this order. It's empty. And then we do some manipulations with something which the order doesn't see. We manipulate with the database. We put some data. We inject. Look, we do insert. In, uh, sorry. We do, uh, we do insert, insert. We do some operations here. We insert something. And then here happens another request of the same, you know, the same long request, which happens here. But before these two lines, between these two lines, this one and that one, we made so many modifications to the database, which the owner doesn't know about. When we come back to the owner and say, give us the statistics, the owner being immutable, not knowing any, well, not, the, the owner hasn't been modified. Nobody touched the owner during that, uh, between these uh, two lines. The owner is still the same. We didn't touch it. But... It returns different things now. Is it immutable? I think it is. Because the object is not modified. The object still points to the same login, to the same database. But when we ask what's going on there, it goes to something very mutable. It goes to the, to the Postgres database. And, and who knows what's there? Who knows what's in that database? Maybe the database, the database even is not connected now. Maybe it's you know completely lost so we don't know what's going to be the result of this matter but the object is immutable that is my point that the object is still immutable even though it is it relies on it represents a mutable entity that's why it's called represent immutability so it represents something which is very mutable but it is uh, but it is immutable by itself so when you design your software, you have to make all of your objects immutable. That's my message to you. You absolutely should not allow anyone to modify any attributes which you encapsulate. That's very important. That's how you make good object-oriented software. 
That's what I said multiple times in my book, on my blog. I actually checked today that I wrote, uh, I wrote six uh, blog posts uh, discussing immutability over the last five years. And they're discussing immutability from different angles. There's one blog post saying that uh, objects have to be immutable, another one saying that uh, immutability have different gradients, gradients, and uh, there's a blog post saying explaining how immutability helps you make the software better. So I would recommend you check all six of them. They are in the um, in the text below this video. But everywhere I'm saying that a good object-oriented code, just object-oriented code, has to have only objects which are not mutable. It shouldn't be possible to do this. Absolutely not. That's wrong. That's terrible. Wrong. You should not allow anyone to change the, um, the dependency which your objects are relying on. That would be a terrible story because if you do that well, you can read multiple articles why it should be the, why it should be, should be this way. But if you do it this way, then uh, then you can't rely on the object here anymore because you don't know whether it's the same order or it already is something else. If you want another order, you do it this way instead. You want Jeff? Okay, you do Jeff. That's a different order. Then you create a new object which points to a different direction, which um, directs you to which relies on different dependencies. That's how you do it. But you never ever uh, touch that object, I mean um, tell the object to work with different dependencies, with different attributes. But what happens with the, with the things the object points to? It's, it's okay if they're, if they're mutable, like in this case. And now we're getting closer to the fourth level of immutability. The most interesting, the most com well, complex, the most uh, controversial, because it may look like mutability for you, but it is still immutability. And here's the practical example. Uh, let me show you the recipient. So we have an object which is called the recipient, uh, the recipient of the email. So it's from somebody who is in the list, somebody who just subscribed to my mailing list on the blog. Actually, I'm using this application. It's, an, it's a real-life web application where I'm uh, maintaining all of my subscribers to my, to my blog. So when you go to the blog, you fill the form, you want to be subscribed, you just click the button and your email gets here and a class recipient is created for you. And then in this recipient we encapsulate just three things. The first one is ID, the ID of the recipient. Again, the direction to the, to the database, the Postgres database. And then the hash, that's what's interesting, that's what makes this class interesting. Uh, I guess some of you may already know what this hash is for, but let me explain. So first of all, and what we do here is that we, look, we just, uh, the ID is coming in, I encapsulate it. The PGSQL coming in, it just gets in. And then the hash is coming in, and I'm doing this dump. So what is this for? I'm making a copy of this object. So you're giving me the hash and I am not encapsulating your object, I'm making my own object. I'm creating a copy of your hash. What it's for? Let me show you what it's for. There are two methods here. The first one is called an email. For example, you're as a recipient, you have an email. An email is the method which returns the email of the recipient. And this method is called email equals, which in Ruby is the way to, uh, to, um, to help the users of this object to, to set the email. So here's how it works on the, on the client level. Look, this is the unit test. Test changes email. So we create, again, the owner of the, of the account, and then we create a list, and then we create recipients, like we did before, and then we say recipients add this temporary, uh, the, the, the recipient with this temporary email. And then we say recipient.email equals after. So here's the after. So when I'm doing this, recipient.email equals, then actually Ruby is calling this method. That's just the convention of Ruby. Like in, uh, in Java, you would do set 
a set email, you would like design the, the full, the normal method. In Ruby, you can actually do the same. You can you can design method set set email, but uh, by convention, it's easier to, to to call it this way, and then and then this method this method will be called. So they look like getters and setters. You may say this is the getter, and this is the setter. It, it, they look like on the surface. What happens inside? Let's take a look. Here, when I'm trying to get the email out of the, of the recipient, I'm going to the database and I'm saying select email from recipient where ID equals $1 and then I provide the attribute, the ID of the recipient. It returns me, this method returns me a collection of rows in the database. I'm taking the first one. Actually, I can add this one, limit one. So it's gonna be only one always. I don't know why I didn't do that. Yeah, so limit one is going to help, but it doesn't matter because it's going to be always one because the ID is unique identifier of the, it's a primary key. So it's going to be always one and I'm taking the first row and then from that row I'm taking the column called email. But take a look at this. What's happening here is that I'm saying, look, uh, this hash, uh, it's not an array, it's, it's a hash. In, in Ruby, it's uh, associated with array, let's put it this way. So the keys and values, keys and values, like a map in Java. So first of all, I'm checking whether this email exists in, the, in, the, um, in this hash, which is encapsulated. So it's like a stash of values, of keys and values for me. So I'm checking whether it's there, and if it's there, then I'm not going to the database. So if the email already exists, it was provided to me when, when, the, uh, when the recipient was created. The hash was provided to me. And that hash was something which somebody already prepared for me, like a stash of values which were retrieved already from somewhere else. And then I don't need to go to the database. I just return it here. What, it's, what is it for? For the performance. If I would remove that, then if I leave it this way, it's going to work anyway. It will work, but every time the email method is called, I will go to the database and do the round trip, retrieving the, the email and returning it back to you. If you do something like that, let me show you the test, uh, test recipient. So if you do something like that, uh, uh, Yeah, if I do recipients, for example, I want to get the full list. Okay, you don't, you don't need, you need to see the code, but I'll just explain. So if you retrieve like a, a thousand recipients from the database, you're not going to do them one by one. You will just go to the list and say, hey, list, go to the database, do the select star, select star from everywhere, select star from uh, recipient. And then the result of this stuff will produce a collection of hash, 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 etc. And then what will happen is that for each of these hash will be something like this created. One, hash one. It's a, you know, it's not a real code. Hash two, hash three. So you will receive a collection of objects, and each of those objects will have the hash, which already we managed to retrieve from the database. It's, it's optimization. It's optimization for performance. Because if I don't do that, if I just re return you this stuff, uh, and I'll give you like a thousand of those objects, you will go and say email from here, email from there, uh, email from there, and you will make a thousand requests. The first one will retrieve everything, but then you will make a thousand more which is absolutely not acceptable. We already have the data. So in order to optimize that, I provide you, uh, I provide the hash here. And that's why, and that's why the code, I lost that piece. Uh, and that's why, you see I'm doing it for many, for many other cases. Uh, and that's why when you check the email, I'm saying this. When you get the email, I'm, che I'm, I'm checking whether the hash is whether we have that in the in the, in the hash. And uh, but the question is why should I why can't I just remove this, 
right? And just say, whatever, just return the email. It's in the hash already. Why do I need to go to the database? And here comes the mutability. Immutability, mutability. We go to this method, email equals. I can, you can retrieve those recipients from the database, R1, for example, R2. They will come to you, R3. And then you can say R1 email equals to hello something. When you do this, when you ask the object to change the email, you will jump into this method and see what happens. You're going to update the recipient, set email to the new value of where the ID equals to the ID. So the email will go to the first you know, uh, substitution, the second one is going to be the ID, and then, boom, we say hash equals to empty. So we clean up what's inside. We clean up the buffer. We remove the buffer. We can actually say, uh, we can actually do something like this. Email if hash uh, I think it's like this. So remove the email if the email was there. But, you know, to make it easier, to make it simpler, I'm just doing this. Just remove everything. Email, whatever it was there. I just clean up the whole stash. And it's empty now. And then if it's empty, when you will get back to r1.email, when you ask for the email, you're going to get, you're going to get the select. So this one, when you ask R1 email, this one is going to be from stash, from, from, the, from the hash, from the hash attribute, from here. Then you change it, and then when you call it again, asking for the email, it's going to be the select. And if you ask again, it's going to be the select again, again and again and again. But this scenario is really, really rare. I mean, this multiple calls for the same multiple calls for the same object for the select and that's why I'm not doing I'm not doing actually it's possible to do this for example mail equals to email so I can't stash it but that will you know require more thinking about whether you are uh, first well I don't think exactly why I'm not doing this I don't know. I'm just cleaning this whole thing. It doesn't matter for, for this discussion. So now the, back to the question. Is it a mutable or immutable object? That's my main question to you. So whether this recipient with these two methods, email and email, is actually mutable or immutable? Does it allow any user from the outside to change the attributes which are uh, which, which actually constitute the uh, the identity of this object. The recipient is a pair of ID and the database. This stuff, which is coming in, is not a part of the identity of the object. It is not even. You see, I'm not even pointing to where it's coming from. I'm making a copy. So this stuff is a local internal buffer, which I am using at a, as, a, as a place in memory where I can store my temporary data, which helped me to work faster, to, re, to respond to your queries faster. But this is not, let's put it this way, this is not my attribute. Even though it is my, it is my attribute, it looks like an attribute because this is the only thing I have in Ruby, I have attributes. But this actually is a piece in memory which I'm using temporarily to store some cache, to store some data which has to be there for you know to help me work faster, to help me, I mean this object to work faster. That's the that's the, the immutability of the of the highest level, which is called um, which is called, uh, in the blog post, it's called encapsulated mutability. So I encapsulate, actually, this, this buffer. I encapsulate this temporary place in memory. I do encapsulate it, but 
it's not something which constitutes the identity of the object. This is the identity. This is the state slash identity. Uh, I don't I don't see the, the big difference in this case. So this is the identity. The object is an ID in the database. So if I change the database, then yes, it's going to be a different receiver. But if I change this, if I change whatever it is inside here, then it's going to be still the same recipient, still the same uh, person who just subscribed to my blog, because it's the same ID in the same Postgres database. And of course, here's the test, you see how it works. So the recipient is there, we just created it, and then we say recipient email equals to a different email, and then this new email is coming out of this, you know, this call, and then I change it again, and it's coming again. Let's run it and see, uh, sorry, Let's run it and see what's gonna what's gonna be there. Uh, yeah, we have some garbage in there, so let me remove it. Uh, all of this we don't need. Okay. Let me run it. Yeah, it works. And let's see. First of all, I insert into the list. So I insert here when I say recipient add, I insert into the list. Then I say insert into, yeah, first of all, I create the list. This is the insert into list. Then I, then I create the recipient, insert into recipient. Then I say select YAML, this is from the list. So when I create the recipient, it doesn't matter. And then I say update recipient set email. This is this line. I update the recipient database and set the email. And then I select the email from recipient. So when I say this, I do the select. Let's put it this way. Let's say uh, A, and let's put B, you know, debugging in its best form. A, B, and C. Let's run again and see what happens. Look, A, and then I say recipient add. I insert into the recipient. And then I say... Uh, let's check the recipient. So let's put it this way. So I just created the recipient and I want to check that the email is the right one. I created with it with this email and I want to see that the email is, is the right one. So A, I create the recipient, insert. Oh, you see, select email from recipient. This is wrong. So we shouldn't select when I call dot email. We shouldn't call, we shouldn't select the email. Why it's happening? Probably because the method add is not making the hash. It doesn't, of course. Because recipients, here is the method add. Let's check what it, what it does. Yeah, it makes something, something. See, recipient, new, I make the insert. I have the ID, but hash is not here. You see, I'm not injecting anything here. So that's why the hash is empty. Nothing is coming in. And that's why on the first call, when I say select email, I, when I say get the email, I go to the database. Uh, there's only one place where hash is injected is when we uh, retrieve multiple recipients from the, from the collection. You see, in this method all, and then I'm making some long, long SQL request. And then I'm injecting the hash. So here, when I create the recipient new, like I explained to you before, so if it's going to be like a thousand or a million recipients, then all of them will be turned into objects, and each object is going to receive the hash. And in this case, the call to email will be optimized. Uh, however, however, here it's not optimized. That's why that's why we're making uh, we're making multiple calls to select email, select email, select email. We three 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 times. We go to uh, we go to the database. We can optimize it even further. Actually, we can optimize it uh, here when we select the email. Look, we may say like uh, uh, email equals to this, all right? And then we say um, hash email equals to email, and then we return the email. In this case, we're gonna make it even faster, and only one request will go to uh, to, the, um, to the database. And we can optimize it here as well, like I told you. Uh, we can uh, save it here as well. But I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it because I'm satisfied with the performance as it is. 
but that's that may be the next level of optimization which will make it even even faster but it is fast the way it is so that's everything i wanted to tell you there are four levels of immutability the first one is the most primitive one is the constant we'll look at it we'll look at it again we encapsulate the text no matter what happens the 2s will return the, the same the same data back no matter how many times you call it no matter when the second example is uh, it's not a constant. It's not a constant. It's going to return different things uh, when we call 2s. Different things, but still it's a mutable object because it points to the same time. The third level is here, like you saw. So we encapsulate logging, we encapsulate uh, the database, and then no matter, and then we call it, and every time it may return different things because it depends on a really mutable stuff outside. And then the final example is that we can actually manipulate with the object we can set we can get but still it's immutable because it points to the same thing in the real world and relies on some temporary piece of data which is of course mutable but this stuff is always immutable you will never be able to change the id of the recipient if it's the recipient if it's, if it's me it's me if it's jeff it's jeff you will never be able to create to, to create Jeff and then change the, the ID of that recipient. That's all. That's all I wanted to demonstrate. Now let's let me check your questions. Uh, uh, that's that's one of the comments. That's mutable. Definitely, hash could be changed. Uh, yeah, like I explained, you started with the comment saying that it's mutable. I think uh, that because hash changes only inside an object, it's immutable. Yeah, like I explained, the hash is something which stays in the object, uh, which only the object knows about, and that's what that's why it's uh, immu that's immutable object for the outside, because it doesn't change the the stuff it it uh, it is loyal to, like the ID and the database. Uh, uh, yeah, the caching. There's another question about the caching decorator in Java. Indeed, uh, we had something similar in Java in the Cactus library. You can, yeah, I wrote a blog post about it a few years ago, which is quite similar to that concept when, when the cache is inside the object, but on the surface, the object is uh, immutable. Uh, yeah, there's a few more comments about that. It seems that the point is, yeah, it should be clear. I mean, you can uh, read uh, the blog post. I'm finishing now. You can read the blog post, actually six blog posts about all that. I believe that the software we write should be immutable, all of it. And I actually dedicated the entire section of this, the entire section uh, in my second volume of this book. Let me show it to you. This is the stuff you may want to buy. It's called Elegant Objects. This is the second volume, which I published, uh, I think, uh, last year. And uh, there's an entire section in this book, which is about um, this immutability problem, which explains, uh, which explains uh, this, everything I said here. It's called Gradients, uh, gradients, gradients of Immutability, section 5.8. So you can buy the book, you may find it interesting. Try to make your software immutable always, not as much as you can, but always. Every time you look at the object and you want to change one of the attributes which are encapsulated and which are not an internal cache, which is not something which only the object needs inside, then, uh, then you're doing something very wrong and uh, the consequences will be only bad for you in the future. Uh, the question is when the Elegant Objects volume number three is coming. Um, that's a good question and uh, I just started to work on it and I created just a few sections and then I'm, I put it on pause and I'm working right now on another book which is called Junior Objects. Uh, that's going to be the book for junior programmers. Actually for people who mm, even maybe not programmers at all, they're just thinking about becoming programmers. And uh, they, this book will, will be like a prequel for the Elegant Objects series of books. Elegant Objects, we're going to see Volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3, it's going to be Volume 4 in the future. But Junior Objects is just one piece, one work, one, one book, which uh, 
like explains very fundamental things for, for object-oriented programmers, starting from explaining what the computer is, what is the hardware, what's the software, what's the different. It's quite an interesting book because it covers like everything starting from the byte and bit and uh, what is the hardware and then finishing with, uh, with the encapsulation and polymorphism and all that stuff. So that's, I think it's going to be an interesting book. So if you want to be one of the reviewers of the book, then you uh, can uh, actually fill the form and, 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 vo and um, um, volunteer to become a reviewer. As you know, I, I, I always you know, select people from, uh, from the community, about 8 to 10 people, and they will uh, review the book and, and be in the book in the acknowledgement section. Already over 60 people submitted their applications, so that's, good. that's quite a competition. But uh, don't, be, uh, don't hesitate, don't be shy. Submit it. The form is in the blog, so find my blog. Uh, click the books, and then you will see the junior objects. About um, the Elegant Objects Volume 3, I think it's, uh, it, it's quite difficult. It's probably going to be the most complex book I've written, because the Volume 1 was quite easy for me to, to write. I spent maybe less than two months to write it, and I was writing it only on weekends. The Volume 2, I spent like half a year or so, it was more complex because the, uh, the, t the subjects and the topics there were... Uh, I, I had to spend more time to, to create the larger pieces of code, to think more. And Volume 3, that's going to be even more difficult because there I will have to give you real practical examples like, you know, best practices, I don't know, some design patterns, which I have to not invent, but I have to find in my real life and put into the book. So the book will have large pieces of code. It's going to be, you know, large, big blocks of code demonstrating how you can implement this and that. Uh, it's going to be interesting, but difficult to write. So that's it. Thanks for asking. Thanks for buying the book. You will definitely enjoy reading it. Uh, see you next uh, Wednesday. Uh, it's not next Wednesday, sorry. Uh, we have these webinars every month on the first Wednesday uh, of the month at 11 in the morning Pacific time. Stay tuned, subscribe to my Twitter, that's where I post the news, subscribe to Telegram channel, and, you know, enjoy your coding. Thank you very much. That's it. Bye-bye.